Revelation uh, chapter 3 is where we're going to be uh, today, looking at the letter from Jesus to the church in uh, Philadelphia. If you're new here, we're studying the book of Revelation, going through the entire book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, including even the weird stuff. So buckle up. We're going we're gonna to have a good summer. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stay in this book throughout the summer. Um, hoping to get it all kind of uh, wrapped up by Advent. So we'll do our Christmas series. And then when we uh, go into uh, January of next year, we'll start, a new, we'll start a new book, okay? So we're really big into the Word of God, okay? We don't just get up here and preach our peeves, okay? <laughs> Can you, you know, I, I, like, I like just going through books of the Bible because then I don't have to go week by week like, what, I, what am I going to preach on this week, you know? You know, thank God. I mean, this last week was so crazy. I can't imagine just, you know, planning a whole sermon but reacting to the, the crazy stuff that was happening this week in the, in the church. So thank God for the Word of God. Just say amen. You know, trust me, trust me on that. Thank God for the Word of God. Um, it, it, who, I'll tell you something. The Bible is actually prophetic. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. The Bible will actually read your mail. So for those of you that are like, I, oh, you know, I'm so frustrated because I haven't, you know, I haven't heard God's voice. You know, God doesn't speak to me, you know, anymore. You know, you know I don't, God doesn't speak to me. I don't think God likes me. No, listen, God loves you, okay? Um, and he's giving you a love letter. And, uh, and if you read it, he'll speak to you. I, I'm pr- I promise you it's actually that simple. Um, in fact, if you're new to this whole thing, um, just go to the book of John. Just begin your love journey with Jesus in the book of John. And you'll just begin to read this. And you'll be like, oh my goodness, I am so loved. And look at what God has done for me and for my sins. And this is such good news. I wish everybody knew the good news. Ah! And stuff, all right? So it trust, it's good. Um, we love the Bible here. We love Jesus here. We love the presence of the Lord here. Uh, and uh, man, it's such an honor to have you a part of what Jesus is doing uh, on, on the earth. It's a good time to be alive, Okay. It's a good time uh, to be uh, alive. All right, we're going to be looking at some stuff today. I think it's interesting how the church deals with, um, with uh, calamity, how the church kind of deals with, with, with hardship, especially when you have all this stuff that's kind of hitting the news. It's already been an interesting year. I, I, I kind of sense, I'm not saying this prophetically, I'm just, I got the gift of like common sense, you know. Uh, you know. And so this isn't me prophesying, but you know, it's already been an interesting year. And I just kind of feel like it's probably going to get even a little more interesting. And it's, and, and it's easy to start reading into things. And it's easy to start ascribing value. And it's easy to interpret things, uh, especially in the lenses of the book of, of Revelation. Uh, when it comes to hardship, okay, when it comes to calamity, that's what we're going to be talking about today. How do we deal with hardship? How do we deal with it theologically? Okay, when you start to go through something really difficult, okay, betrayal, okay, uh, when you go through something, how many of you have ever gone through some difficult stuff in the church? Uh, how many of you, when you first started going to a church, you were expecting that people in the church were going to be different than people in the world? Okay, all right, yeah. And so all of it, you know, it's easy to go through some stuff, whether it's in your church or whether it's with your own, with your own family, um, with your own friends, within various community, and you go through something, and then you realize, wow, I got, here too. I got hurt here too. Like I got hurt in my own natural family, got hurt by my parents, got hurt by my siblings, got hurt by my children, okay? Uh, and then I got hurt by my job, I got hurt by my boss, and then I got hurt by my pastor. And, and, and then it's easy to come to this place where you're just like, man, I'm just done, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm done, done with the, whole, with the whole deal. Like how do we process through this? Um, you know, my mom, my mom would say that there'd be days like this, right? She warned me of, t- of days like this, but she just didn't say there'd be this many, <laughs> right? And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, before we dive into Revelation chapter 3, uh, Revelation begins on the day of resurrection. It was the Lord's day, the day that the early church deemed uh, as the time that they would celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So up until this time, okay, uh, uh, the, 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 the early people of, of faith, followers of Christ, would practice Sabbath on Saturday. After Jesus lived, died, and resurrected, the early church deemed the first day of the week, the day of resurrection, the day of the Lord, uh, uh, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. That's why we're here on a Saturday. Uh, that, it's not Saturday. What day is it? 
Just testing you. That's why we're here on a Sunday, because we're celebrating the resurrection of the Lord. It's the first day of the week, and we're stating that as believers of Jesus, we're going to begin this week by celebrating the fact that he is not dead. He's very alive. We are not alone. We're here together, and no matter what we're going through, we're going to get through it, that this hardship is temporary, but the love of God, the family of God is eternal. Okay, so it was the day of resurrection. It was, uh, it was Sunday, and John, John the beloved, okay, John was the disciple that Jesus loved, okay, as for the other 11, <laughs> okay, all right, all right. All right. But John did life with Jesus. He was John the, the beloved. Jesus lived, died, resurrected, and now John has been exiled to Patmos. So he's a prisoner, okay, part of a, 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 a prison colony there, most likely crushing rock. Okay, by, by day, and, and, and it was on a Sunday, he has this, 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 this ecstatic, revelatory experience, and he hears a voice that comes from behind. And John says, I turned, fascinating word choice here, to see the voice. Okay, not to hear the voice. I turned to see the voice. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. We'll go to the map here. Uh, these seven golden lampstands, okay, uh, symbolize seven literal churches, okay, in what is now modern-day Turkey. Now, the number seven is important. The Revelation is filled with sevens. And it means completeness. It means wholeness. There's seven days in a week. That's the, the complete week. It comes to completion. Okay, so we have seven churches. Okay, this is symbolic of the church in her entirety. Yet these are seven uh, geographic churches with seven different personalities. Okay, sets of issues. Okay, and these are seven imperfect churches. Why? Because there's humans in them. Okay, humans in them. Okay, now if it wasn't for humans, the church would be perfect. Okay. And I don't really know what to do about that. I don't, like, if you're looking for the perfect church, you're going to have to find a church full of, like, puppies or something, okay? But the second you show up, it's going to ruin it all, right? Um, so these are seven churches with personalities, okay, even with sin issues, okay? So for people that are like, yeah, I'm done with the church, there's sin in the church. Yeah, that's not a new thing. That's not an American thing. Okay, um, that, that we see here, seven, now, where's Jesus, okay? Now, you don't see Jesus in the outside of it with his arms crossed saying, I can't stand these guys. These guys, their issues, their sin. Jesus is like, oh, there's sin. I can't even look at them, okay? <laughs> no, where's Jesus? He's standing right smack dab in the middle of the seven churches, Okay. Now, for anyone that's ever studied the book of Revelation, most people say that the book of Revelation is the book of, of the revelation of Jesus the King, His Majesty, and the throne room, okay? Yes, absolutely, can't wait. We're going to have such an awesome journey uh, diving into this. There, absolutely. But what John sees first, before John sees Jesus as King, he first sees Him dressed in white with a golden girdle. He's dressed as a priest, Okay, and he's not sitting, okay, because in the early temple, there was no allowance given to chairs. So Jesus is doing what priests do. He's standing amongst his church. He's standing and serving his church. This is a big deal for you and I. The reason why this is a big deal is because Revelation invites us into a place of participation in our nature in him. Which means that if Revelation, the purpose of it, is to discover who he is, then this is a part of our identity process, okay? So many times as Western millennial uh, Christians, uh, we tend to want to make everything about, yep, you guessed it, identity, okay? So, you know, we're, we're going to do, you know, what series should we do January of next year? Let's do a series on identity, okay? All right, good. <laughs> All right, and then what? We'll do another series on identity, okay? And then what? And then we'll do a, an advanced <laughs> revelatory series on identity. Why? Because I need to, I need to be me. <laughs> so I need to know who I am, okay? Because this whole thing is about me, <laughs> okay? So <laughs> we need more teaching on identity, okay? And here's the truth. Okay? If you want to know who you are, 
Okay, then you're going to have to know who he is. Okay, so th what does that mean? If we're going to know who we are, we've got to know who he is, and then we participate with who we are in him. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. It is no longer I who live, but he who lives in me. And then and only then can you say, I am the righteousness of Christ. Amen? Yeah, absolutely. So this is what we're learning. We're learning who we are. And that means that there's going to be an invitation to step into that, that place of I am a king, okay? But you don't get to step into revelation of Christ the king until you first step into a revelation of Christ the priest, yes. which is what? It is that place where you learn to stand and serve imperfect people with a lot of issues and even are still sinning it's that place where you're not where you say I can't have anything to do with you because of your issue no it is that place where I love you I will serve you I will intercede for you I will correct you I will tell you the truth because that is who he is that is what he does in his word and that is what we do as well so as a church okay we're stepping into the priestly nature of Jesus to stand and serve and to love, okay? And then we're going to step into this place of understanding Christ the King, okay? So that we can be a generation of kings and priests on the earth, okay? And I think that this is really important. If you're going to be great in God's kingdom, if you're going to step into this royal identity, you first have to learn to be a servant, okay? All right. So God uh, gives to the seven churches, this is amazing. Jesus gives to the seven churches seven letters from John, his messenger. It's going to go uh, from the island of Patmos, okay, by messenger, okay, to Ephesus. You'll see that there, bottom left, and from Ephesus up to Smyrna, from Smyr Smyrna up to uh, Washington, D.C. there, uh, Pergamos. That was the, uh, the political Roman capital there where they would be making important decisions. Uh, down to uh, Hollywood, down to L.A. there, which is Thyatira, okay? All right, a bunch of artists, a bunch of demon-possessed pagan <laughs> artists there, okay? Down to, down to Sardis, very uh, wealthy, d d down to New York here. Sardis, Sardis, a place of commerce, industry, trade, okay? We talked about Sardis last week. Um, a really interesting church. Uh, just with one little issue. They were tolerating a false prophetess operating with the spirit of Jezebel. Okay, interesting. Was that right? No, that was Thyatira, wasn't it? And Sardis was the, Sardis was the, the compromised uh, church, worldly church. Went in to, to, to change the culture and became the culture. Okay, and uh, where am I? And then Philadelphia, coming down into Philadelphia. Now, uh, Philadelphia is very interesting. And this poor church, man, talk about, talk about hardship. Talk about you know, some brutal type stuff, man. We'll, we'll be looking at this. But if you look at your life and you're like, man, my life, phew, I haven't been able to get ahead. If, if you're like, man, this is tough, okay, then you're gonna, you're gonna identify with um, Philadelphia and you're gonna leave here with some good news today. You're gonna leave here with some, with some, uh, some, uh, some joyful courage that will be the fuel that you need to be battle ready. How many of you, you need some joyful courage? Like you've, you've been beat up a bit this last year, but you need, you need a word from Jesus this morning. If that's you, you came to the right place, okay? Hey, let's stand for the reading of the word. This is Revelation chapter three, verse seven. And this is to the angel or the messenger, if you will, God's servant put in charge here in Philadelphia. Right. The words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Okay. Behold, I have set before you an open door. Just declare it with me. Open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my, my name. Verse 9, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Verse 10, But because you have kept my word about patient endurance, just declare that with me, patient endurance. 
okay? That's kind of a big deal here. Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming. I will keep you. I will guard you. Uh, it means I'll keep my eye on you, okay? To try those who dwell on the earth. Verse 11, I'm coming soon. And hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown, okay? Uh, so uh, things are going to get wild, but, uh, but guard yourself, guard your heart, stay vigilant. Verse 12, the one who conquers, just to clear with me right now, conquers, okay? That, that means wins. That means first place, okay? The one who's at the, end of the, at the end of the battle, okay, on the battleground, still standing, all right? Um, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and neither shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, okay? Yep, that means you'll get a nice tattoo, okay? And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Lord, we ask, Lord, that we would have, by your grace, the humility to not only read your word, but to be uh, read by your word. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would hover over our souls, that you would inspect us, that you would know us. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that we would leave here transformed by the renewing of our minds. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would come and awaken in us a fresh tenacity to partner with you and who you are. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this invitation to be a part of this new and glorious system, the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I thank you, Father, for, for heavenly perspective for each and every single one of us today. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would do what your spirit does so well that it would fuel us. And Lord, that your spirit would confront any spirit of apathy, lethargy, laziness that comes from a place of hope deferred that has made the heart sick. I thank you that even in this service, you're going to heal heart sickness and you're going to heal chronic tiredness. You're going to heal depression in this service. Lord, you're going to liberate captives in this service. Lord, we love you. We are all about who you are and what you stand for. And so we give you this time. In Jesus' name, all the saints of God said, amen. amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Man, Philadelphia had a rough, man. They had a really rough. In fact, um, just within about 40 years prior of receiving this letter, the entire city was destroyed by an earthquake. And so these guys are survivors. Um, I mean, in, 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 this is during a time when they didn't have the same kind of engineering. I mean, earthquakes were, were really a big deal. I mean, completely destroyed. They had it so bad that Rome actually came in and told them that they, wouldn't, they didn't have to give tribute or pay taxes to Rome for five years. Okay, guys, that's not a big deal to us as Americans. I, I mean, it kind of would be, right? You don't have to pay taxes for five years. That's, that, <laughs> that's kind of cool. But... <laughs> But keep in mind, guys, this is Rome, okay? And Rome didn't exactly do bailouts, right? So if there had been a pandemic, okay, in this part of the known world, right, like you're not getting checks from Rome to help you out, okay? So they go five years, okay, without having to uh, pay tribute. Um, they begin rebuilding, okay? And, um, uh, and one of the ways that Philadelphia was known for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, the drive in their economy was through agriculture and more specifically through their vineyards. So Philadelphia was known for their wines. So they're rebuilding, they're planting vineyards, they're getting all this going, and their reputation for quality wine became quite outstanding. So they're, they're, they're rebuilding. And what we know from history is that apparently Rome got jealous and ended up coming in and shutting down all their vineyards because apparently their, their, their wine was better than the wine that was coming out of Rome and Roman uh, vineyards. So this is very difficult. This is very tough. And the reason why is they've lost everything. They are rebuilding, okay? And then their own government comes in and says, you're too successful, so we're going to penalize you and make sure that you're not successful, okay? Right? Kind of like doing business in Seattle, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. 
interesting, right? You're too successful, right? You know, minimum wage to 100 bucks an hour. Here we go. You know, you're welcome, right? So difficult time uh, and difficult place. Keep in mind, like this, these guys are survivors. These guys are struggling just to, to get ahead, and they are just south of New York City. They are just south of a city that is that is just where business is booming. In fact, they're just south of a city that has a literal river that's filled with gold. Okay, so these guys are mining gold. They're very prosperous, but it's also the place of commerce and, and trade. So these guys have it really tough. Now, for the early church, what's happening here is the early church in Philadelphia was banned from participating in worship on Saturday in their synagogue. So this is during a time when Rome for a season saw Christianity, they're called the followers of the way. Uh, uh, they saw uh, Christianity as simply a fringe, as a fringe split off, a, a, a denomination, if you will, of Judaism. But that began to change as the church continued to grow. And as the church began to grow, okay, not only did it become a threat to Rome, it also became a threat to Judaism. Here's what happened. The Christians in Philadelphia were banned from attending worship at the synagogue on Saturday. This is a huge issue because culturally there was a pact, if you will. There was, uh, there was a, 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 a deal made between Rome and between the, 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 the Jewish people, which meant that if you were Jewish, you wouldn't have to pay tribute to Caesar. You wouldn't have to say, they would actually say, Caesar is Lord, okay? Now, if you were a Jewish uh, person, if, uh, you wouldn't have to do that. You were given an out. But for the Christians, okay, that were kicked out of the Jewish church, okay, they would not be given that provision. They would be treated as non-Jews. So imagine being a Jew. Imagine uh, believing in Yahweh. You also believe that Yeshua is Messiah. And now being disowned by your fellow uh, Jewish family, if you will, okay, and being told that you can't worship with your Jewish family. So now they don't have any sort of legal buffer uh, with Rome. Um, they've, been, they've been outed, okay? And this is, this is a big deal. This would have been very, very embarrassing because, for example, uh, it's Saturday, and on Saturday you'd go to temple. But now you're forbidden to go to temple, so now you're out and about, and people would say, why aren't you at temple today, okay? And you'd be seen as a, uh, as, as a, as a non, you'd be seen as a, as a, as a dirty Gentile, if, if, you, if you will. Now, there's different interpretations for how this gatekeeping would take place at the door of the temple. Uh, one uh, one uh, commentator I, I read said it's possible that there could have even been a peephole on, on the, the temple door where people would be inspected before coming into uh, the synagogue. Uh, I don't know how they, how they would have gatekeepers there, but this was the reality, that if you believed that Yeshua was Messiah, okay, if you, be, if you were a follower of the way, okay, when you came to temple on Saturday, that door was locked to you and you had no access. You had a closed door. That's the context for this scripture. So now let's look at this uh, again. Um, to the church of Philadelphia, right? The words of the Holy One, okay? True, the true one. And the one who has the key of David, okay? He's, he says, hey, this letter is coming from not just the root of David, but the one with access, the very key of, of, of David. Speaking of, of the royal key of David, the very kingdom of David. So this is kind of like, this would be, uh, triggering language, okay, to, to those who said, no, no, Yeshua does not have the key of David. Yeshua is an imposter Messiah, okay, and this is Jesus saying, no, from the true and perfect Messiah, from the one who has the royal key of David, access to the kingdom of David, okay, the one, look at this, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, and then he says, I know you. He says, I know you, and I know your works, 
This is a big deal because as we've studied each of these churches, we see the churches have different qualities, okay? And some of the churches, they have love, but they don't have works, okay? Uh, some churches have love and works, but they're, they're tolerating um, uh, uh, witchcraft in, amongst their theology, okay? You, you see these different things. This is what he says. He says, I, I know you. You have a faith that works. Isn't it interesting to, to think that Jesus looks at his church and one of the assessment tools when he looks at his church is, is, is there the kind of faith that is working amongst the people? Okay, he's not talking about a faith that works when we gather. He's talking about a faith that works in a body in your daily lives. He's not casting a judgment based off of their gatherings. He's, he's placing a judgment based off of who they are, who they are in the corporate context. This is the people of Philadelphia who believe Yeshua is Messiah. And he says, I know, I know your works. And then look at this. He says, behold, this is so awesome. Imagine being the church, okay? And you've been, you've been kicked out of your Jewish community. You're seen as a Gentile now. Uh, and, and you have a locked door at the synagogue. Look at this. He says, I have set before you, what? An open door. And a door that no one is able to shut. Okay, this is direct. Uh, this is a direct link bridge to Isaiah twenty two twenty two, where it says, "I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open." He goes, "I know that you have but little power." What does that mean? It means that you, in and of yourself, have little ability. Okay, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make, look at this, this is, this is something else. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, okay, I will make those who have made you an outcast, who say that they are Jews, okay, just by their blood. They say that they are Jews, but they are not. He says, what are they? They're liars, and behold, I will make them come down and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Okay, this is very, um, this is Jesus not being seeker sensitive, okay? This is Jesus just saying, this is the truth. This isn't popular, okay? Um, uh, uh, but, he, but he says, they may have kicked you out. They may call you Gentiles, but they, they, they lack any sort of understanding as to the spiritual principles of how this family actually operates and how this family actually works. And he says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. And just say it one more time. Patient endurance. This is what he says. He goes, I will keep you. I will guard you. Okay. They may have kicked you out of their system but you're a part of my family. And I will keep you from the hour of trial. Okay, so a trial is coming to that whole, to the whole world, but a trial is coming to that whole known world of that time. We know we could be as close in this, in this time when this was written. This could have been as close to two years away from AD 70, which was when, the, uh, when Jerusalem burned to the ground, including uh, the temple in Jerusalem. Now, it could have been as far away as, as 40 years from this time. So they're not too sure, but it could have been as re Needless to say, it would be in their generation that they would see one of the biggest uprising, it, the persecution of Nero against, um, uh, uh, against Jerusalem to where it would burn to the ground. The streets would be filled with blood. The smoke would go up. The moon would be turned to blood. Um, very, very historic, okay? And uh, so he says a, a trial is coming, okay? A tribulation is coming. He, uh, and, uh, and know this, if you're faithful to my word, okay, I will, I will guard you, okay? I will, keep, I will be your refuge in this. I'm coming soon, okay? Uh, he says, I'm coming soon, but hold fast to what you have. Why? So that no one may seize your crown. You, you see what he says here? Um, maintain vigilance. Okay, you've got my attention. You've walked this thing out with integrity. I see that you've got, you, you've got it rough. You've got it hard. Know this. I am in this, I am in this with you. But know this. It's going to get very, very tough. So you need to guard your heart. You need to stay battle ready so that you don't lose your inheritance. So that you don't lose, that you don't lose your crown. Okay? 
uh, to the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Okay, this is, this, is, this, is, this is very important. Why? Because Jerusalem is about to be completely destroyed. The temple is about to be completely destroyed. And this is what God is telling him. Um, uh, for those that make it through this time, even though Jerusalem the, in the natural is going to burn to the ground, there is a true and perfect Jerusalem that is to come. Okay? Uh, and, this is, and this is what he says. Um, the, there, there is a... a um, uh, 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 and know this, the, 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 the temple itself in the New Jerusalem is different. In that, it's not a structure. Okay? The temple in the New Jerusalem is different in that it is a people. You are the new temple. Okay? So there's a New Jerusalem. There's a new temple. And to those who conquer, you will be pillars in the new city with a new name that comes from my God. And it comes from where? This is interesting. It says, and the new Jerusalem is not on the earth going up. He says, and the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. The end of the book, okay, the church doesn't go up. At the end of the book, heaven comes down. The new Jerusalem comes down. The people of God, the family of God, they are the temple. And the righteous, the conquerors, are the pillars within the temple. Okay. This is really uh, uh, this, this big stuff here, okay? And then he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, this would This would have been such a big deal to the church. Why? Because they would say, here we have a Father. Here we have uh, a Savior. Uh, Yeshua knows us. He knows what we're going through. He hasn't abandoned us. In the natural, every door has been shut. In the Spirit, we have a door that's open that no man can close. In the natural, a temple's going to burn. But in the Spirit, I have been made into a, a temple. In the, in the natural, Jerusalem is going to fall. But in the Spirit, a new Jerusalem is coming, the city of our God, the city of heaven, the very city of God is to come. This would have been a letter of great, brought great courage, a great significance to the church. When you read the book of Revelation, it shouldn't stir your heart with fear. It should stir your heart with courage. You're a part of something that is not temporal. This is what Jesus says. You're experiencing hardship. The hardship is temporal, but you're a part of a kingdom that is eternal. Don't be, don't be moved by what you feel, by what you see. Why? I assure you it's very, very temporary. But know that what I'm forging in your heart, what I'm forging in your soul, that which is being purified in you, that will last, that will remain, okay, to those, to those, who, th those, those who conquer. The reason why I put a various emphasis on the various uh, aspects of this text is that this text has been used to be uh, a, a bit of an end times kind of uh, look at the church that gets to escape before the tribulation comes, okay? It is this idea um, that uh, for, for the good church out of the seven, okay, for this, for this one church, okay, that there's a tribulation that is coming, okay, and this is speaking of all of us today in America, okay, a great tribulation is, is coming, but don't worry, why? Because we're going to get raptured out of here, and once we're raptured out, the tribulation uh, will, will come. And, and this is a big, big deal. Why? Because for many, many believers, they, they believe that they will never have to face the tribulation, okay? Uh, hardship, uh, hardship, okay? Uh, and don't worry. Um, just, we'll, just, we'll make it. God, God's getting us out of here, okay? The idea is to escape. But let me just suggest to you today, for those uh, that are part of Eden, okay? We should not be looking at escaping hardship. We should be looking at engaging the hardship. Why? Because there is not a generation that has lived on this earth that has escaped hardship, okay? The rapture is not the promise. Christ is the promise. So with that being said, how do we, how do we face hardship? What should, what should our theology be regarding hardship? We should expect it. What should our theology be around the tribulation? We should expect it. We should expect hardship. We should expect tribulation. Why? Good question. That's a very good question, whoever asked that. I saw that hand in the back. Because Jesus said that in this world you will have tribulation. And he did not say 
don't worry, I'll protect you from it. In this world, you will have peaches and cream as long as you trust me. You'll never have difficulty. Nobody will ever hurt you. Nobody will ever betray you, okay? If, if you have a rough life, if you've had a rough, if everybody's been mean to you, if your soccer coach used to verbally call you names, okay, give your life to Jesus today and you'll have no more hardship. You'll have more money than you've ever had. You'll have more raises. Your car will run better. Your wife will be a lot nicer to you. She won't ask you to do anything for her, right? Like, you know, <laughs> um, you, uh, your, your dog will stop running away. Even your, even your neighbor will be cooler with you. Who wants to get saved? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. <laughs> All right. No, no, no. Let me just say this. Maybe, may, if you're looking for a comfortable life, maybe don't give your, your life to Jesus today. Because nowhere in the Word of God are we told that the Christian finds comfort through all the natural things that, 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 that make people feel good in this life, okay? Christianity is not a feel-good religion, okay? It, you, can do some, you can just do some history. You know, most, most of the Christians in the early church died horrible, tragic, R-rated deaths, like the, the most brutal deaths imaginable okay so we've got it pretty good in America okay we've got you know we've got it pretty good we, we sure do I'm so grateful to live in the United States I, I am I am so grateful to live we are so stupid blessed I've tra we've traveled all over the world been to all kinds of nations okay and yet you, the United States of America is the best nation on this earth we are so blessed we are so blessed by the Lord and because of that we should care a little bit more because of that, we should do things like, and this is going to be radical for some, like voting. Like I said, radical. I'd give my life for Christ, yet I can't, I can't vote because it's too much work, you know. Yet we should care. We should care. And here's the thing. If you're going to give your life to Christ, you should expect heart. Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation. You will have suffering. You will have betrayals. You will have natural calamities. There will be earthquakes. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. There will be a lot of things that just aren't fair. It's not fair. <laughs> It's a sad thing. I mean, we should be praying for Kanye, right? But, but you know, because you know, Kanye is, is, ha has it rough, okay? He doesn't have enough money and doesn't have enough stuff. And he gave his life to the Lord. And he thought everything, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, God didn't come through for him. I'm not kidding. I, apparently, he has is, he is turned away from Jesus because Jesus didn't give him what he wanted, what he deserved to have, or however he is, however he is saying it. All right. No, no, no. Expect hardship. Expect tribulation. And when it comes, be of good cheer. That word cheer means courage. Okay? So when you get the beat down, okay, no, I'm expecting this. I'm expecting the battle. And when it comes, be battle ready. Be of good cheer cheer have some courage okay have some fight in you take heart why jesus says because you're here you're here you're facing sickness here you're facing calamity okay here you're facing betrayal here you're facing wars and rumors of war here you're facing all these things in this natural in this natural space in this physical space this is what jesus says i have overcome the world the cosmos. I have overcome every factor that time and space can contain. If it's plaguing you, if it's tormenting you, know this. He has overcome it. So no matter what you are facing, it is temporary. Why? Because you are not in this world. You are not of this world. You are in him. You are an eternal being that walks in the shadow of death. But my friend, if you are in him, you'll never die. There's no end to you. 
you won't cease to exist. Are you with me? You are an eternal being, which means this suffering is temporary. So no matter what you're facing, know this, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and the light is Jesus, and his arms are wide open, and there will be that moment where he says, you made it, now arise and shine, let's rule, let's reign, okay, you didn't just make it, you conquered it, you're a conqueror, you are a, you are a victor, okay, you took dominion, this is what he says, there's going to be some stuff, but when it comes, be battle ready. Okay? Just, just say it with me. Expect it. I'm going to expect it. Okay? And when it comes, I'm going to take, take courage. I'm going to take cheer. I'm not going to lose my joy. I might not be happy about it, but I'm not going to lose my joy. Well, what's my joy? My joy are my roots that go down into the soil and are connected to an underground reservoir. There, I, I am connected supernaturally to, to, to ancient rivers and to ancient streams so that no matter what happens in the weather system, it may not rain today. It might not rain for the next three months, but my roots go down deep and I am pulling from a different supply. You might lose your job. You're pulling from a different supply. People might be mean to you. You're pulling from a different supply. People might not be telling you what you need to hear. You're pulling from a different supply. You don't don't need humans to feed your love tank. Why? You're pulling from a different supply. You don't have to manipulate people. You're pulling from a different supply. You don't need favor from man. Why? You're pulling from a different supply. So take courage. Take courage. Rejoice. Have joy. Like I said, you might not have happenings. The, the, the happenings might not be happening for you. But know this, your roots are just going down deeper. This is just, an, I'm just putting down deeper roots. I'm not going anywhere. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. You know, if you don't have roots, you're going to be blown around by every little wind. Every little wind. Because you don't have roots. You put down some deep roots, the storm comes, your roots just go down deeper. Blessed is the man whose roots go down deep, who's planted by the, by the river. Yeah? Take courage. Take courage. Take courage. We don't run from the drama. We run into the drama. We don't run from the funerals. We run into them. Okay? We don't run from disaster. We run into it. It's opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Okay? What's endurance? Endurance is the factor or power of going through pain without giving up. Pain is interesting. We all, we all can feel pain, and that's actually a blessing. It's actually not good if you can't feel pain. Um, pain is an indicator that God has built in your body, okay, and there's different kinds of pain, emotional pain and physical pain, okay, different kinds of pain. But pain is something that communicates to your body, this is not the way it ought to be. Okay, when you feel pain, you should know this. This is not the way it ought to be. And if this is not the way it ought to be, if this is not the way God created it to be, then know this, God is not the author of it. When you feel pain, I said when, when you feel pain, don't stop and say, this is God and he's trying to teach me a lesson. When you feel pain, don't say, oh, this is God punishing me for something that I did. When you feel pain, okay, know this, your punishment fell on Jesus all of it. Therefore, when you feel pain, just say, this is an opportunity for my father to exercise his faithfulness within this trial. Endurance is your ability to 
feel the pain. And when you're a believer in Jesus, you feel it deeper than those who are not believers. Why? He took your heart of stone and, you ga- and he gave you a heart of flesh. You feel deeper. You cry harder. You carry other people's pain. You come alongside of them. You care and you carry people in your heart. Endurance is that ability to feel the pain, to be willing to hold the pain, to be willing to come alongside of others who are in pain. When you don't have Jesus, you run from the pain. You do everything possible to not feel the pain. Billions of dollars are spent by Americans to try to live a pain-free life, a pain-free existence. But for the believer, we say this is a part of my role as a priest on the earth to feel the pain, to carry the pain, and to endure in the pain. I expect the hardship. The hardship is producing endurance. I might feel the pain. I might bleed. I might be betrayed, but I will not give up. I will not be uprooted. I will not be blown to or fro. I am expecting it. I expect the hardship, and it's producing endurance in me so that when you're in pain, I don't run from you. I run to you. I say, I have been through that. I have been faced with that temptation. Oh, that thing took me out as well. I pledge to not think more highly of myself than I ought to because I am here to restore you so that someday you'll be there to restore me because we are a family and we don't have a standard of perfection. We have a standard of Christ Jesus and his righteousness that has redefined us. Therefore, we don't kick people to the curb when they let us down. We come alongside of them and we say, I can bear this pain with you. I can endure this pain with you. I'm in this with you and thank God you still feel the pain. Thank God you still feel it. Thank God you still cry. Thank God you still trust in him. We expect it. We take courage. We fight for each other. But then what do we do? We conquer. We conquer. We've got to learn to conquer. We've got to learn to be victorious. We've got to learn to have a higher standard. And you say, what do you, you know, we did this, um, uh, Sean did this awesome with the guys and Ralph and our safety. Eden's got this awesome safety team here and we're making sure that we're, we're you know, you know, I'm, I'm a good guy, okay? I think like a good guy, okay? I, I, and, but then uh, I'm being told that there are people out there and they're not good guys, <laughs> And they don't think like good guys. So sometimes you got to get some training because you're like, how many entrances do we have here? And if a bad guy came here, like what would we do? And so we had awesome training yesterday. We had all these, all, it, was, it was cool, you guys. This place was, we had two of our amazing women of God here, okay? But this place was full of men from churches across the region. Why? Because they want houses of worship to be a safe place for families to come and encounter Jesus, okay? And we had um, ex, ex-military guys and ex-police officers, and they were doing this, this training. And, but the guy, the guy was up here, and he was saying, um, you know, and he, you know he, he packs a gun, you know, when he's at the grocery store. And he trains, like, police officers, all this kind of stuff, all, all this training. So he's probably got actually two guns on him, you know. Actually, he might even have, like, three guns. He might even have a blade, Okay. Might even had nunchucks on him. I don't know. This guy, his, his, all of his clothes are a little baggy, so you know something's happening there. You know what I'm saying? So this guy, he's training us. Like, cre- here we are. Men of God, it should be in our nature, okay, to, um, to, to protect our families, to protect our house of worship. This is, this, is, this is part of what it looks like to be a shepherd, to not just be godly but godlike. Pretty awesome. And this is what, this is what he said. He goes, if something happens at the grocery store, I have to assess that situation. And I got to see if it's my battle or not. Because I'm not a police officer. Okay, so it's not my responsibility to get engaged in certain battles. See, so at the end of the day, I have a commitment with my family. 
okay, that at the end of the day, I'm going home to my wife and my children. So something happens at the grocery store. I have to look, am I willing to get involved in this battle if it means that I'm not going home to my wife and my children, right? Pretty, pretty interesting stuff, right? Like questions I don't really ask, ask myself, okay? But, but, but interesting questions. And this is what he said. If something happens, he goes, if, if a child is being hurt, if I see a child just about to lose their life, he goes, I know myself well enough to know that I might make that my battle and rescue that child, assessing the risk. That might mean that I don't go home to my own, my own children. He goes, my default answer is no, I, I leave that child because I got to get home to my children because I know myself enough where if I see a, a child about to lose his life, I'll probably jump in, I'll probably make that my battle. He goes, but know this, if I make that my battle, I'm going in 120%. And I will be, this is my own words, I will be the most aggressive mama jamma in that. I, that thing is going to get, that thing's going to get, because when I go against that bad guy, I'm going with my wife and children in mind. I'm going to go up against that enemy. I'm going to solve that situation and then get my butt home to my wife and children as quickly as possible. And I forget the word that, that, he, that he used in, in describing this. Do you guys remember the word that he said about being victorious? In, do you remember what it was? Yeah. I'll just use the word conquer. Listen, there's a battle for the earth right now. There's a battle for a generation right now. There's a battle for our nation um, right now. And the church needs to kind of figure out, are we going to make this our battle or not? Okay, we've got to kind of assess some things, okay? Are we going to make this our battle or not? But let me just suggest to you that the things that we get involved with as a church, we're not going to be able to flirt with principalities and powers. Why? Because they're powerful, okay? And if we're going to, if, if you're going to take your life, if you're going to take your life, if you, seriously, if you're going to take your spirituality um, seriously, you're going to have to ask yourself the question, what are the battles that I'm willing to fight for? You know, are you, are you going to be willing to fight for the heart of your spouse? Are you going to be willing to fight for the heart of your children? Are you going to be willing to fight for, for God's church? Are you going to be willing to fight for righteousness in the earth? And then, and then if so, just know that that fight could cost you everything. And you're going to have to kind of, you're going to ha kind of have to assess that. But here's the deal. If we fight, there's only one outcome that's, accept that's acceptable. And that is to conquer. That the battles that we choose to fight, just, 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 just being scraped off the pavement is not an option for us. Okay? The battles that we choose to fight, we got to have in our mind, I am, I am going back to my wife and to my children. So because of that, well, I'm going all stinking in. Because at the end of the day, I'm not willing to go down with this thing. Losing for the church is not an option. Losing for the believer is not an option. Why? The inheritance is for those who conquer, those who overcome. And what does that mean? you got to think like a champion. Uh, we, in, our, in our family, we've got a declaration that I do with, my, with our children. We say, we are stots, and we are the best of the best. We are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. We are, we are leaders. We are not followers. In, in a very bold, very audacious, scandalous statements. Why? Because I'm, I'm training up my children to think like the head and not like the butt. I'm thinking of my children to think like a boss. I'm thinking of my, I'm raising up these, you know, we'll see how, how, how they'll, they'll be good. Okay? <laughs> We're doing our best here. Okay? I want for us in Eden to think that same way. Okay? I want us to be owners and not renters. I want us to take dominion. I want us to take responsibility. If God hasn't called you here to Washington, get out. Figure out where God has called you. But if he's called you here, you better have a business. And then business is. You better own some property. Okay, you better have some place you can host some people and do some meals and do some discipleship. Okay, if you're not good at anything, go take some cooking classes. Okay, you're not good at anything, go, go take some martial arts classes. Okay, you, you, you need to have something to give. You need to have something to offer. You need to look at your life. Say, what are my talents? What are my abilities? I'm part of the church. I got stuff to give. I got stuff to offer. I'm not just here to have my back scratch. I'm not just here 
here to take. I'm here to give. I'm here to live. I'm here to take ownership. We can make this thing better. We can see the kingdom of God come if I'm willing to say yes to the Lord. But this is not a passive yes. This is to the conqueror, to, to the victor, to the person that's got some fight in it. And if you say yes to him, expect hardship. And when the hardship comes, take courage, take joy, okay? And then when the hardship comes, you got a covenant with me that you're going to go into the hardship saying, I will not be taken down by this hardship. I will conquer it. We will conquer it together to the overcomer, to the, to the conquer. Christ is the prize. And you will be a righteous pillar in the new Jerusalem. No door will be shut to you. No matter what happens in the natural. Men shut the door on you. Jesus says, I've got a door that's open to you that no man can shut. They burn down your temple. I, you are a part of a new and glory. They burn down your city. That, that wasn't even your city. There is a new and glorious city of God that is coming down from the heavens that you are a part of. All of this, it's temporary. And yet it is training for eternity. And we get to be. Will my, all my conquerors stand up with me uh, this morning? Okay. God is wiring us. He's reprogramming us. So we get untethered okay, from the false humility of religion, okay, and we step into the courage that is in our salvation in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to get you out of here so you can get to McDonald's and get back here to get baptized tonight. Is that good? You know, we're going to be baptizing some people. Just close your eyes real quick. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person here in this room, we've all done some dumb stuff. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. The Bible says that, that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're a whosoever, so am I. So if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he'll be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, bring you into his family, and give you his Holy Spirit that will be the grace that you need, okay, for this kind of endurance, this kind of courage, this kind of fuel, okay? You can't hype up this kind of endurance, this endurance can only come from Christ himself. You don't need a pep talk today. You need a relationship with Jesus. You need his spirit, the Holy Spirit, indwelling inside of you. So that's what we're going to do. Let's all pray this together. Just say, Jesus, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are God. You died on a cross for all my sins. You resurrected from the grave on the third day. You ascended and are seated at the right hand of the Father where you intercede for me. You are my high priest. You are my Savior. I ask you, save me, O oh God. I give you my life. Break the power of sin in my life. Break the heart of heartache in my life. I invite you into my hope deferred. I receive by faith your Holy Spirit to give me the grace to overcome. Just hold out your hands, Father, I pray. Lord, that you give to each and every person right now the gift of your glorious Holy Spirit. That your Holy Spirit would come into people right now. It would come like a fire. It would come like a flame. It would come like a wind. Lord, it would come like love and grace and peace. Lord, that your kingdom would come. That your justice would come. For people that are saying, I've been enduring the pain. I've been in this pain, and this pain is not the way it was meant to be. Jesus, would you come into people's pain right now? Would you come with your love? Would you come with your fire? Would you come with your flame into people's pain, even into the pain in their bodies? Lord, that that pain would leave right now as Jesus, as you come into that pain. Lord, even people that have been carrying um, betrayal in their hearts, and now they have heart problems and heart 
disease and heart sickness. Jesus, come right now with the flame of your love and we declare right now healing to arrhythmia issues, healing right now to hypertension issues, healing right now, yep, 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 to all, all four chambers of the heart right now in Jesus' name. To those who have been hurt by the church today, Father, I ask that you would come with your grace. That you come with your, with your uh, Lord, with your supernatural ability that we would be able to forgive. That, Lord, that we would be able to engage with your girl, your bride, your church. Lord, that you would come right now in that sweet, tender way that only you can do. And Lord, that there would be an openness in people's hearts to be able to re-engage with your ecclesia, with your bride in this new season. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We trust you, Lord. And um, you listen, you know, patience basically means you got a, a, a super long fuse. And let me just say this over every person here. Your fuse is longer than you think. So don't be planning for your next explosion. Don't be planning for a detonation. Don't be, don't be planning for the end. Start planning for a new beginning. Start planning for a redeemed outcome. Start planning and preparing for reconciliation in your home, reconciliation in your marriage, reconciliation with your children, reconciliation in your home group. Let's prepare for redemption. Let's prepare for reconciliation. Let's prepare for relationship. Just declare to me right now, my fuse is longer than I think. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen and amen and amen.